Our presentation today is our 2019 risk year in review, and, and I'll be presenting that uh, subject today. How's 2019 treat you? Now, I went into this uh, presentation with a little bit of trepidation in doing our year in review one month early but it always seems like it's hard for us to do a year in review presentation in january because we're always rolling out new programs we've got a lot of different things to cover at that time and so the determination was made this year to to do our year in review in december and so i will be i will be knocking on wood on my uh, particle board desk um, throughout the course of this presentation in an effort to not jinx what we're doing and the success that we've had this year, because uh, a lot can happen in one month. But, uh, but we wanted to, wanted to talk about where we've been, what our focus has been, and, and some of the changes that have happened through the year. But I ask you that question, how has 2019 treated you? I was, as I was thinking about this presentation, thinking about the changes and how quickly a year goes by, I've had a lot of uh, you know, family changes. I had a son get married, had a couple of, a couple of kids graduate from high school. And, uh, and I'm quickly, quickly making my route to being an empty nester. And that's a, and that's a major change in life um, that happened, happened so quickly and a lot of that over 2019. And, uh, and so I was thinking about that, uh, how, how that has changed and also thinking back on my dozen years with the trust and the various different things that we've done and, uh, and some, of the, some of the fun and enjoyable things that we've, that we've had over the, over the years. Um, and also some of the tragedy and the, and the challenges that we've had as well. Um, as, the, as the trust, we're a pool. We, we pool our resources together with you, our members, and uh and if we succeed you succeed and uh vice versa and if we and if we uh fail um it, it's also on you as well because bad things have happened where you are we share our resources we share um we share the uh the challenges that go along there hey brent could you help uh looks like miles is having some audio challenges can you help him out um, got it <clears throat> I hope everybody else is able to hear as well. If a couple of you wouldn't mind just typing in the chat box, make sure that we're not having some audio issues there. Um, just let me know you can hear me okay. Um, so 2019 is a, has been an interesting year and uh, in general, it's been a great year. <clears throat> um, but let's talk about, uh, talk about the world. Um, pretty, pretty crazy things happened around the world. We had wildfires yet again in California. Um, two years running with just some of the most disastrous fires that that we've ever seen. Um, we had hurricanes and earthquakes and various different challenges that are that are happening all around the world. Even as we speak, the Philippines are are getting pounded by a, by a hurricane. Um, but when we talk about the about the trust, it was a pretty good year. We didn't have any of those massive catastrophic things that that happened around the world. And in general, we don't have that in, in the state of Utah. Sometimes we'll have some, some pretty, pretty nasty weather and we can have some flooding and things like that. But uh, some of those terrible things, we don't, we don't see as much as other regions of the world. But in 2019, we saw the good, the bad, and some ugly. Not, not too much, but, uh, but we did see that. We had some major changes at the trust that you, that you may be aware of. We went from our TAP, the Trust Accountability Program, to the uh, TARP program, the Team Appreciation and Recognition Program. Basically, if you want to, if you want to get the money back in the discounting, um, you need to put in that uh, that TARP program. Have a have a qualifying incentive program in place, and you get the money there. Um, as we did that, we we shifted our resources and shifted our focus in the loss prevention department. For, um, more towards best practices and back to back to risk assessment things that we've uh, things that we've done for a long time. Um, not that not the tap was not important or successful because it was. We saw every member that um, that got tap have some improvements in their organization. We saw overall those tap members reduce their losses significantly. Um, but we'd run but that uh, program had kind of run its course. We'd run it for five years. And uh, and it was time to make a make a change, 
And so we've been around to many of you and talked about the TARP program and putting that in place. We've also talked to you about best practices and done best practices reviews with you over the year and, uh, and talked to you about your programs and, and how things can uh, perform well or how you can perform better and uh, what, what programs are essential to have a good risk management and safety program. We've done a lot of risk assessments, um, literally hundreds of risk assessments at, uh, at your um, different organizations around the state. And uh, in most cases, we've seen, we've seen good improvement. In some cases, we've seen some of the ugly where we've gone out and, and found, some, found some scary situations. I found a few in parks that were just waiting for a, for a child to be injured on, on some playground equipment. And that was a little bit scary. And there were there are definitely things that uh, told us that not only do we need to be out uh, looking at facilities, but we need to be encouraging you to look at your facilities as well. Um, we've uh, we've once again trained thousands and thousands of people and and given dozens of, of webinars, uh, live trainings, um, and even our recorded webinars have have had thousands of people watch those recordings over the years. So. It's been a uh, it's been a very positive year, and we're we're excited about that. Some of you this year may have had an OSHA visit, and just a reminder on that that you may be um, that you may be having um, OSHA come Utah OSHA come and visit you soon. They visited many of our many of our members uh, throughout the state over the last couple of years through their through their um, enhanced program where they're focusing on local government agencies. Most of those have been positive experiences and it always does my heart good when one of our members calls up and says, hey, we had OSHA visit, can you help me with this? And I'll say, how did it go? <laughs> and generally the response is, it was really good. We need to put a program in place or we need to do some training on this or that. And we're, we're always happy to help out with that, but it's, it was a, a but in general, They've been very positive experiences and so hats off and kudos to you for your efforts um, to build your safety programs and have good things in place um, but just a reminder to you that if you haven't had an osha visit your time is coming and it's probably coming quicker than you uh, quicker than you would like because uh, because they're taking about 50 local government agencies at a time going out and hitting those uh, hitting those agencies and then moving on to another 50 so you can expect it pretty pretty soon all right so i wanted to take our um take our presentation today and kind of talk about through the different lines of insurance and losses and and uh you know i, I realize that as we talk about these things i'm talking about people's lives and health and and all of that but we talk in terms of losses and claims and all of that so um i i, I hope you'll <laughs> i hope you'll forgive me if i if i talk in in the insurance lingo a little bit because those are really the numbers that we have um, but i uh, but i do know that uh, that each one of these incidents involves uh, potential pain and suffering for for you or somebody in your organization or somebody outside of the organization that you have an impact on and uh and and believe believe us that each of us in loss prevention we care about that and uh, when we look at the news and we see those things that, uh, that is something that is a challenge for us to look at each day and look at the news and see some things, something happen in your neck of the woods and maybe to you, um, we're concerned about those things. But we want to talk about really our performance in the various different lines and, and how we've done. Here's the first number we wanted to talk about. And I think it's probably the most important number. And this is, this is um, the number of fatalities. And once again, I'm knocking. <laughs> I'm knocking on wood um, vigorously here and rubbing the uh, um, rabbit's foot or whatever it is that will keep that number at zero. I think this is the most important number. This is the thing that we should all focus on. We talk about zero fatalities on the highway and all of that. Um, this is definitely the number in our, in our workers' compensation um, area and auto, all of these things zero should be our ultimate goal and let's keep it that way so definitely wanted to uh to point that out as as a as a giant success story for this year if we keep everybody alive um you know we definitely want to look at all of our areas but uh but that's the number one um i kind of wanted to talk about uh about the different lines of insurance and and where things come from and what those what those challenges are 
oh, I, this is one of those uh, one of those inspections that I was on or, or risk assessments. Uh, I was out at a park and I found this slippery slide and I was up looking at various different things and some of you might uh, um, might note some challenges with this. But I just want to ask you a question. Do you think how do you think I got down from the top of this slide when I took the picture? Leave that. Um, <laughs> I'll ask you a question here. What is the number one cause of our property losses? Think about that to yourself. And if there's a group of you there, say it to each other. I was going to do polls and then I thought it would be a little bit cumbersome if I did this for each of the lines. So I decided, uh, decided to forego, forego the polls today. But when you ask it, you think about property, our buildings and our, uh, you know, uh, some, of, some of our equipment will, will uh, fall into that property category parks and playgrounds and, and uh, treatment plants and, and all of thing, those things like that. What is the number one cause of property losses? And I looked just at 2019 um, to, to get us a current view, but I'll tell you in general, fire is probably our number one cause of property loss in any given year. Um, but this year that wasn't, that wasn't really the case. Um, as it turns out, we had other things pop up in our property area that, uh, that we don't normally see as property losses. We had some drones that were lost. Um, we, had, we had some police um, canine officers, um, dogs that were, uh, that were lost. Um, or, and, uh, and at the trust, you do have coverage for that type of thing. If a, if a canine officer is in the, in the line of duty, um, and they're lost, they, they have that coverage there. And so those were things that we saw. But in general, fires, floods, and theft are really our major areas of property loss. And so in each of these lines, we wanna talk about some prevention for those things. Here's one that, uh, that I probably can't harp on quite enough because, because I think it's still a challenge to each and every one of our organizations. And that's securing our facilities. As I was preparing the presentation, I went through um, all of the claims for this year. Lots of uh, lots of different claims, and and one stuck out to me where a, a where a backhoe had been had been stolen and taken from a, for a joyride, and uh, they took it out to a motocross uh, motocross track area where there were jumps, and they were. Whoever it was was trying to trying to jump the backhoe, and they ended up tipping the thing over and doing significant damage to the um, to the backhoe. And it, and it just highlighted the the point that uh, that I think we're we're pretty comfortable in this state with our with the security of our facilities, and we're maybe just a bit too trusting um, with our equipment and our facilities. We should really look at our security in our facilities. Make sure we're locking our vehicles and pulling the keys out of those when we, when when they're not in use. Same thing goes for our equipment. Um, if you're leaving a piece of equipment over over a weekend, um, definitely make sure it's secured there. And let's try to bring that uh, equipment back to the shop if at all possible, or a secure place where we can um, prevent people from from messing with it or uh, or stealing it. Um, look at our facilities, and this goes to the general liability side of things as well, but um, are, are there opportunities for, um, for a child to get into our facilities or into our equipment where they could get injured? Let's look at those, at those opportunities and fix that where we can. Uh, just a couple other things to think about on property prevention. We need to be physically going out and physically inspecting our facilities. Get out and walk through and look for look for extension cords, look for missing plates on on electrical outlets, look for overloaded circuits, look for um, our regular maintenance. Are those things taking place? Plumbing is also a major cause of property loss because um, floods can happen from broken pipes, and this time of year, as we start getting really cold. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to have problems with that. So we properly winterized our, uh, our facilities and, and plumbing in particular on that. So, so we don't have freeze and, and, and broken pipe situations. Um, housekeeping is a constant problem with, with fires. Um, if we've got good housekeeping and things are stored where they're supposed to be, in particular things like flammable liquids, gasoline and, and other flammables, if they're not in a flammable storage cabinet, 
that just radically increases the uh, the possibility that we'll have a fire within our facility. So store that, store that well, and good housekeeping. So if something bad does happen and we've got to get out, we can get out safely. So um, in general, and and this is the same with my garage as as anybody else out there, our facilities tend to get um, to get messy over time. And if we're not regularly going out and looking at housekeeping and cleaning those up, it can be the cause of uh, fires, it can be the cause of, of injuries to people, trips and falls, those type of things. Um, and then we have a few specialized things. Over the years, we've, we've seen some trends um, in our public housing area where, it, where we're having fires in those, uh, those facilities. And so if you find yourself working, working for an organization like that, we have to ask ourselves, what's our fire prevention plan? And, uh, and how do we help people, particularly people who are coming from another country? We have a, have a fairly large influx of refugee populations. And, uh, and a lot of these fires have happened in the apartments where those refugee people are living. And a lot of those are related to cooking. Um, and so what can we do as an organization? Well, we've got to make sure our facilities are up to, up to date and up to code and, and well-maintained. But we can also help those people living in our facilities to understand appropriate use of, uh, of our cooking facilities and, and how to cook with, with oil safely and various things like that that can, that can cause those types of fires. Um, okay, so we'll move on. And, and folks, if you do have questions, type those into the chat box or the Q&A box, and, and I'll be happy to answer those as we go along. What is the number one cause of, the, of our general liability losses? Um, this, is a, this would be would be an interesting one to uh, to throw out to a poll, but like I said, it's kind of a pain to go back and forth in between the presentation. So, so between yourself, what do you think? General liability. We're at fault for doing something. So, what's the number one cause of liability loss? Well, it comes it comes down to water um, in various different forms. Uh, primary water from our culinary water when we have a line break and it floods a home or a business, um, those, are, those are liability losses that are frankly gigantic. Along with that, we have sewer losses, sewer backups. You've done an excellent job over the years of reducing those sewer backups, but we still have those. Um, and, uh, and we're still spending quite a bit of money on those. And in addition to the money, Having somebody with raw sewage in their basement is is probably the best way that we can come up with we can make somebody really mad and make somebody in our community not happy with our with our organization is is by doing that and so um, water is one of those major areas of concern uh, we look at this at this graph struck by or contact with well that's a pretty broad category actually and it comes and it comes down to things like uh, we're mowing. We're mowing the uh, side of a road, and a rock flies out and breaks somebody's window or breaks somebody's teeth, which has actually happened. Um, it comes. It comes to if we drop something on a on a vehicle, a tree branch, or um, things like that, will fall into this category. The most costly one uh, that we see that we've seen this year in our general liability pool has been the other category, and that's kind of a broad category as well. And it involves enforcement uh, liability. It, it involves things like harassment, discrimination, or, or employment problems, uh, in, uh, improper termination, things like that. Um, and then various other categories are there. Um, so um, these, are the, these are the major areas. Oh, and slips, trips, and falls. I can't forget that one. That's always one that will go up and down. Generally, we're doing a good job on this. We don't see a lot of slips, trips, and falls. The challenge is, is when we do, they're expensive. People get injured, um, and uh, they can be a they can be a really nasty claim. And so, slips, trips, and falls are an area to, to be concerned of. So, on the prevention side of these things, one of the major things is on our on our sewer program. I've got a slide. I'll talk about that next after this, but. Proper installation and maintenance of our water lines is important. If we've got some old, old, old lines that have been there forever and they're past useful lifespan, we need to look at how do we go about replacing, it, replacing those lines. We need to look at our installation process. If we install those, make sure that we're following 
um, the proper standards in doing that. If we have a contractor installing those water lines, we've got to get our eyes on that and verify that they are also following those standards. We've seen a number of situations where, where water lines just haven't been bedded properly. They're put right in against really sharp rocks. And over time, um, just with the, the movement of the water in the lines and vibrations in the streets and all of those things, it's going to wear a hole in those lines and, and cause some significant damage. If you know where, there's some, where there are problems, focus some energy on that. And focus, your, focus some more of your budget towards those things in preventing those. Equipment inspection and maintenance are just so essential um, the the maintenance of getting out and looking at those facilities when you find there's a problem fix it um, then when you're all done with that document 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 doesn't have to be anything anything fancy it could simply be um, a register of the activities that you've done that hey we identified there's a problem with this piece of playground equipment and uh, we took it out of service and we fixed it and then when we're uh, and then when we're done, we put it back into service and we document what we've done. We've got to be able to show that we've been reasonable and prudent in the things that we're doing out there, um, because in the end of the day, if there's a if there's a claim, that's going to be the major question: is have we been reasonable and prudent? Are we grossly negligent, or have we done everything that is that is reasonable um, to do? And that can be the the difference between. Um, we owe this because we were negligent or we don't owe it because because we've done everything right and sometimes bad things happen. Um, so just on our, our sewer best practices, just want to let remind everybody that we will be sending out our sewer um, survey um, right away. Please, when you get that, fill it out and send it back in to us. We've got uh, maybe Brent can if he knows this. Tell me how many the number of uh, number of sewer entities. I think it's about 130 something uh, members of the trust that have a sewer system, and so each year we send out a we send out a survey to see how it's going. And and what we've tracked over the years is that you're doing much better. We went from a, from cleaning frequencies up near five uh, five years down to we're right about three years. Um, manhole inspections have in, have increased. Um, rapidly, um, exponentially. And along with that, we've seen the number of number of sewer manholes or sewer backups and the cost of those backups going down significantly. Um, other things to look at on this are knowing where your hot spots, knowing where your problems are in your sewer system and putting putting extra effort towards those. We might have to clean a given section of, of main line once a month. Or once every two weeks, if that's what it takes to to keep that from backing up. Um, if we've got those types of situations, there may be there may be some uh, replacement or or maintenance that we need to be doing there. Um, an FOG pro program. Most people don't know what that is, but it's a fats, oils, and greases program to handle those uh, handle those bad problems that can get into the into the sewer system, particularly around. Um, big producers like restaurants or uh, or food processing areas, uh, companies, those are areas that can can jam up our sewer system and cause backups. So have that program in place. Take a look at this sewer report card that we'll send out. Once once we do your do the surveys and you send your data back to us, we summarize that and put it into a form where you can compare yourself to really large entities or really small entities. We put you all on the same. Um, on on the same ground, so you can say, how are we really doing, and then put proper uh, direction towards that. Um, management losses are an area where um, where we where we definitely saw um, more losses and uh, and some costlier losses over the last year. And let's talk about what those are. <clears throat> Law enforcement is one of the really risky parts of, of doing business as a local government agency. Um, as a matter of fact, we see um, competitors um, at the national level, um, big uh, general liability carriers saying, we don't want law enforcement liability because of the bad name it's got within recent, recent years. And they're just not writing insurance around law enforcement liability. Well, we see similar trends 
in the state of Utah, maybe not as bad as it is in other parts of the state, but it's definitely something that we have to uh, pay attention to. We've got to work hard to have good law enforcement. And so some, uh, some parts of, of putting together a law enforcement program that, uh, is, you know, you're never immune from these things, but has a much better chance of, of avoiding claims and avoiding the, the big dollar claims are having good policy um, making sure that is up to date and there are policy services out there that can help you help you keep those up to date but you can have the best policy in the world and if your officers are not trained on that policy um, it's not going to do you much good so we need to train the officers regularly and verify that training um, along with that verification of the training our supervisors have to supervise we've got to be able to watch what our officers are doing and uh, just like in any organization, in any employment, you've got, uh, you've got great people and every once in a while you get a bad egg or somebody that does something the wrong way. And our supervisors have got to be aware of that. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's just uh, they're maybe not aware and they, haven't, they don't know the policy. Um, but our supervisors have got to be aware and take action on that. Um, that is essential for us to be able to, be able to uh, defend ourselves if we're accused and we will be we will be accused um, accreditation is also another thing we just did a webinar on that last week or last month excuse me um, about how you could get accredited with the chiefs of police association um, in the state and that's just a third party saying that you have good policies and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing with those policies so if you're interested in that go back and check out that uh, that webinar that we did um, and in employment issues, this is one where we've where we've seen some things that uh, that we don't like to see coming in, and uh, a lot of those are around employment, and many of those involve lack of documentation. So let's talk about employment issues. We need to train our supervisors on how to be a supervisor. A lot of times, supervisors are not um, they didn't go to school to be a supervisor. They were just good at the job that they were doing. And, uh, and so we said, well, this person's good at that. Let's make them the supervisor. They may not come into that with any skills to manage people. And so, and so we've got to take some time and work with those supervisors and help them know what their responsibilities are and help give them the tools that are needed to, to do that. Uh, we need to train those supervisors along with training everybody. Harassment discrimination training, we'll be doing that in January as our regional training. Uh, we should be doing that at least every other year, if not annually, um, but always catch up those people that, uh, that may have hired on in between times when you do, when you do that training, send them to our regional training. Um, this is just essential. We live in a different world today than we did five years ago or even a year ago in the world of harassment discrimination. People need to understand um, there are risks on both sides of this. Anybody can be a victim and anybody can be a perpetrator of this. And we all need to understand what those, what those risks are. Um, so train everybody. We need to act when there's a problem. We need to let our supervisors know that each one of them has a responsibility to take action if somebody alleges that there is a, hey, there is a problem with harassment or discrimination or any other type of um, type of discrimination in the workplace, um, they need to they need to take action. Now, supervisor may not know well, what does it mean to take action. It may be coming into your office. if you're the if you're the boss or the HR person, um, let them know that they have to take action. That is that is just essential um, for us because we know that bad things happen. People do dumb things. People say things they're not supposed to, and sometimes they do ugly things, um, and uh, and that's unfortunate. But it's part of it's part of humans being in the same room together. Eventually, those type of things happen. But what we do when those things happen is is the most important point. There, we need to take the appropriate action at the point. We can't just justify and say, "Oh, that's just." insert name <laughs> of, of this person. That's just the way he is. Um, you just got to deal with that. That's not the case. We need to, we need to take action and do the appropriate things. Um, so we sometimes have to 
terminate an employee. Sometimes we have to take disciplinary action. Um, an essential part of that, and one of the challenges that we that we have seen recently, is having appropriate documentation. Now, fortunately, the, these situations have have come uh, have come to light because you asked the trust and said, "Hey, we're considering." doing a termination on this employee or we're considering this type of disciplinary action, are we okay? <clears throat> and, uh, and with a little bit of quizzing, we found that no, um, these, uh, the people who called had not done their due diligence. They had not uh, given due process to the employee um, and there was not documentation. And so highly encourage you um, to look at your process, particularly when it involves discipline, disciplinary procedures, and ensure that we're documenting those things, ensure that we're giving um, our employees an opportunity to, to take care of any of those problems that they have, that they have appropriate due process in, in this. Our goal should be helping that employee um, to succeed. And uh, unfortunately, at times, they we do need to make terminations, but, it, but that should not be our original goal there, it should be focusing on that employee, helping them to get better, um, documenting those issues. And if it does get to the point where we, where we do need to make a termination, we'll, uh, we'll be set to, to do that and have all of our ducks in a row. Um, number one cause of auto liability losses. Ah, here's a, here's a good question for you. And folks, just a reminder, ask questions anytime here, type into the chat box, the Q&A box. Um, auto losses. This has been a, this is, we've had a perennial uh, number one cause of auto liability losses. So what do you think that is? And you're saying it to each other. Well, in 2019, it actually changed. Um, we should have a drum roll and kind of, this is a momentous occasion, um, but maybe not, maybe not quite as, quite as momentous as we, as we hoped. Um, backing is not the number one cause of loss in 2019. Um, the number one cause of loss is no unsafe act by the insured. What does that mean? Well, it actually means quite a few things. <clears throat> in the clearest sense, it can, it can mean it wasn't our fault. Um, we were rear-ended and the other person got a citation and their insurance paid for, um, paid for our damages to our vehicle. Okay, that's a pretty um, that's a pretty simple way to go about that. There's some other losses that fall into this. Um, in kind of the strange world that we're in, we have we have uh, law enforcement um, out trying to stop bad guys, um, stop people that are that are uh, trying to get away or, or or they're doing something bad, and we end up with some losses um, when our cars get smashed up in those types of things. Those fall into this into this area as well. Um, so we can't really rest on our laurels yet. We still, we still see backing crashes right up there in the highest causes of loss. And that's a concern to us. And we want to focus, focus some attention on that. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Just in general, um, in our auto, in auto losses, we have, um, a really odd, anybody in here that likes statistics, if you like statistics, um, I won't say <laughs> that's 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 kind of a boring thing that insurance people get into. But we've had a weird thing: 397 car crashes for three years in a row, and we're, it's looking like, depending on what the, this last month does, we'll be done to 397 car crashes over um, the last four years running. That's that's pretty amazing. Statistically speaking, um, we ought to be in Las Vegas if we can hit the same number of car crashes every year um, for four years in a row. Um, does that mean does that mean we're just totally totally stagnant and it, and it's going to be exactly the same? Not necessarily. We've actually added a significant number of autos over those four years, and so our rate has gotten better. As a as an organization, the trust you um, have a have an instant rate, an auto instant rate, about three and a half percent, which is better than the national average. Significantly better when we look at some of the categories like law enforcement um, and emergency vehicles. 
uh, as well as as well as commercial motor vehicles, we have a significantly better incident rate, but we have some we have some areas where we can improve a lot. And uh, we look at the backing crashes and some of some of these other crashes. We can definitely knock those down. Um, another another statistic that we look at: 11.1 percent violator rate. You say, what does that mean? Well, each month, if you signed up for a motor vehicle records uh, program, you'll get a report that will list all of your drivers um, in your organization and what their record is, if they have a valid driver's license, and if they have any violations. These are citations, tickets, those type of things on their record. And over the time that we've been doing this program, we went from almost 20% violator rate down to 11.1%. That's pretty amazing in my book. Um, it's something that uh, something that we look at as a true success story for you out there managing your drivers. And uh, so congratulations on that. If you're not getting that MV MVR report, um, give me a call, give Brand or Doug a call, and we'd be happy to, uh, um, happy to provide that <clears throat> Uh, provide that report for you each month. You need definitely need to be um, in the upper level of management to receive that report. So, um, so not everybody can receive that, but the people that uh, are in upper management get that. And we love to provide that information because it helps everybody to be a better driver. So, um, just wanted to throw on here. Auto losses by department. I should have asked the question ahead of time, but I probably led into it a little bit. Which department of, of our members who, who categorize their losses by department has the most auto crashes? And this one is not even close. Um, in our law enforcement area, um, we, we see about 44% of all the crashes come from the cop car. And so that's that's definitely an area that we that we could and and need to improve. After that, public works is uh, is definitely second, um, and then administration and environmental. These are garbage trucks, solid waste um, hauling vehicles, um, are those areas that come in come in about the same in third place. Uh, so each of you in our organizations, we have to look and say, where are these losses coming from? Is there any common thread? Are they all completely different? Or are we having a bunch of backing claims and they all happen in the same place? Um, I had a, we have one organ or one place where um, there's a pole that's out in the middle of a parking lot. It's a private business's parking lot. And this pole has actually taken out three police cruisers. Uh, over time to the tune of about $60,000. And so that's an area where, where we need to look and say, hey, there's a trend here. That's a poll that we probably ought to see if we can remove the poll, make it visible or do something about that poll. Let's look for commonalities in our losses and see if there's something that we can work on. Um, so like I said, managing your auto liability, we wanna manage your drivers, get that MVR, MVR report, supervise your drivers. If you have a report of your driver doing something that's not right, um, let's have a sit down and, and talk with them and, and let them know that this is driving safely is a requirement of their job. Um, vehicle inspection, making sure our vehicles are safe out there. And that includes equipment, trailers and other apparatus that we may be pulling, be hauling around. Um, make sure that they're in good shape. Uh, Pre-trip inspections for commercial motorized motor vehicles. Those are required by law and uh, and uh, the uh, highway patrol is is really cracking down on those types of things as well as licensing um, on uh, let's, it would be the driver's license division licensing CDL operators and so we've got to take a close look at that part of our operations as well. Oh, just an FYI on this: what's the what's the biggest um, the biggest loss that we had in in our auto pool this year? It was actually a fire engine burned. Um, and so we want to look at managing our vehicles and, and what type of what type of condition are they in. Um, inspection, you know, some of some of the vehicles that we operate are very um, specific fire apparatus. We have bucket trucks, we have 
Um, we have uh, back trucks and jet trucks, rod trucks, all of these things that are that are very specific, and they have they have some potential risks there. And, and we should identify what our, tr our maintenance and our inspection is for each one of those and be doing that. Have a, have a written program that says this is what we're going to do and document as we do those. Training um, is also a part of that. We just did our de defensive driving regional training, but we're happy to come out and do that for you again. And then look at your incidents. Like I said, is there a commonality in these things? Is there a way that we can prevent this from happening to the next person? And backing. Everybody should be looking at, at backing at their facility and, and say, are we having backing problems? Um, is, this, is this an issue? And, and really looking at our losses, most of you probably have had backing crashes. And so let's look at a policy to do that. Let's train our employees on the selecting the right parking spot, getting a pull through spot, backing into that spot. Let's look at our equipment. If there's a problem with the, with the equipment, um, maybe it has a, a really bad blind spot. Um, technology can provide cameras and, and various, uh, various different ways to help, us, um, to help us with these backing things. But sometimes it's, it's just getting out and looking behind, having a spotter uh, for that big apparatus and equipment that uh, uh, is difficult to see around, or maybe it's dark, use a spotter. Use these things, these simple techniques to prevent those backing crashes. Oh, and I was reading, I was I was reading through claims, and this one uh, this one kind of caught my attention here. So uh, this is the description: Deer darted across the road. Officer attempted to miss the deer by swearing and braking. Deer impacted vehicle on front passenger side fender. So as a control method, swearing uh, probably doesn't work. Uh, all right. So moving on, number one cause of workers' compensation losses. This is a big area. This is one of the, this is uh, um, year over year, probably the biggest area of loss that we have because we have thousands and thousands of employees out there doing jobs that are sometimes dangerous. And so ask you out there, what, what is the number one cause of uh, workers' compensation losses? And it really is sprains and strains, followed closely by slips, slips trips, and falls. Um, either of those, um, are, are bad and many times they, um, they contribute to similar types of injuries. Ask you a question here, what body part is the most often injured and the costliest when it's injured? Ah, this, is, uh, this, is, this one has actually made um, a pretty significant change over previous years. So you discuss that among yourself and I'll answer it. The answer is, Knees. For years, we had a we had a rash of shoulder injuries that drove not only the number of losses but the cost of losses, and that has been replaced by knee injuries within the within the last last year. 2019 has shown shown that both in the number of injuries as well as the severity, the cost of those injuries. Knees have been bad. So how do we go about preventing <clears throat> that type of injury? Here's a list of different prevention methods for, for workers' compensation. Knees, well, as we look at those, we look at how are they happening? We see a significant number of those knee injuries happening with people getting in and out of their vehicle, whether it's a piece of equipment, a backhoe, or, or, or a large truck, or sometimes it's just getting in and out of a car or up onto a trailer or jumping off of a trailer and we see these knees blown out. Sometimes knees are associated with law enforcement activities when they're, when they're trying to take a, um, take a suspect into custody and, and uh, they end up in a physical altercation. We see that happening. Um, many of those knee injuries happen in training, whether it's in the fire service or law enforcement, um, we see a significant number of knee injuries in our training. What can we do to, what can we do to prevent that? How can we redesign our training um, knowing that this is, uh, this is the number one frequency and dollar cost type of injury that we have out there. How do we design this training so we get realistic training, uh, but we don't, take our, we don't take our people out? Maybe, maybe having a career ending injury. Um, so here's some other things from a workers' compensation standpoint, as well as for everything, safety committee meetings, 
are just uh, just essential. Having a group that is dedicated to uh, to looking at your risk program, looking at your safety program, to in to investigate incidents, um, to look at our past problems, to look at our history, and say what is it that that is causing us problems, and then um, taking action to put some preventative steps in there. Sometimes you may throw your hands in the air and say, I just don't know what we're gonna do about this. Well, hopefully that's where, where Doug and Brent and myself can come in. When you come in, when you come up with something and you say, I don't know what we can do to prevent this type of accidents, but we're having, we're having these regularly. Well, that's where we can come in and we can help, um, help you with those and give you some ideas of maybe what other members of the trust have done or other experience that we've had um, out there. Employee engagement and training is an essential part of this. Employees need to know what your expectations are. They need to know what the risks and hazards are and what controls are there, they're required and what they, what they really should just be using. Um, and then engaging those employees, making them aware. We talk about our TARP program, the, the, the uh, um, incentive programs and, and how important they can be in just engaging the employees and letting them know that this is this is a part of my job <clears throat> um, that uh, safety is a part of my job and uh, it's just as important as the amount or the quality of work that I get out there. It's doing that job safely. Let them know that they're a part of this program and if, and if we all succeed, they're going to succeed and they'll get a little benefit out of it as well. Um, on workers comp uh, case management, this is, this is important as well. Direct care. In Utah, we have the luxury, other states don't have this, but we have the luxury to say, everybody goes to our clinic. Um, now employee can change doctor um, after that, they have a, have a one-time change, but if we can get them to the appropriate doctor first, a lot of times that avoids some problems. Sometimes doctors um, or providers, whatever, whatever they may, doctor, nurse, whatever, they may not understand the workers' compensation system. They may not understand the importance of getting employees back to work quickly. And so if we can get them to our clinic um, that understands workers' compensation, understands that you have a return to work program and you'll get this employee back to work even if it's on light duty, um, that is just the, the essential part. So, so direct care, get the employee back to work. Realizing that your EMOD can be seriously affected um, by not getting somebody back to work, even if it's just three or four days that will have an impact. You can have two claims, one, uh, two claims for $1,000, one that has um, lost time and one that doesn't. The one that doesn't have lost time, you get a 70% reduction in the amount, of, uh, the amount of that claim that hits your EMOD. But that claim that has lost time, 100% of that goes towards, your, um, goes towards your EMOD calculation. So get that, uh, get that as part of your program. We are going to accommodate light, uh, light duty, we will accommodate restrictions and get people back to work, and then open that line of communication with the, with the employee as well as, your, uh, as well as the adjuster for the claim, and let's work to get that employee healthy as quick as possible, because that's really the, the overall goal of, of workers' comp. Um, summary. Covered a lot of, a lot of material today. Um, We've had, like I said, good, bad, and ugly, but overall, overall, it's been a great year, and we want to thank you and congratulate you on your efforts in loss prevention, in safety, in uh, making your communities, making your workplace a safer, better place to work. When you do that, people will enjoy their, their work more. They will um, have more trust. They'll feel more engaged that they're a part of all of this. Um, so just a couple of, couple of reminders about things. We need to inspect more. We need to train more. We need to act when there's a concern. We need to um, manage and, and be aware of these things that, that can potentially be risks. Ones that we've talked about today, ones that are specific to your organization. Document, document, document. That's always an important thing. Um, and that's it for the, for the presentation um, today. Please, if you have any questions, type those into the chat box and uh, or the Q&A box. I'm just going to try to see. Out of presentation mode for a minute.
Doug was on here, if he had anything to say. Brent, anything that I missed? Uh, you did a great job, Jason. I, I think you're right on with saying that we always have to be diligent and looking for things because you never know what could get somebody and what could cause an issue. So great job. I think you covered it very well. Thank you. Absolutely. I, you know, as I, as I walked around and, you know, I talked about a couple of uh, playground issues and these were, these were really serious things. And as I talked to the member about it, they were just kind of aghast. Oh my gosh. And, uh, you know, and I, and I described some of these things as, yeah, that's a kid killer. Um, and, uh, and they're like, wow. And, and the reality is we've just got to get out and physically look at these things. One time I was, uh, I was doing a, I was doing a pre or doing a report from one of my risk assessments and I'd been out to a playground and, uh, and doing it. And one of my kids walked up and looked at my shoulder and said, dad, you get a climb on the playground equipment when you're out there looking at it. I said, yes, I do, son. He said, wow. He was pretty impressed with that. But that's the reality. You got to get out there. You got to climb on the equipment. You got to you got to see what's there to identify those hazards, and then let's get them taken care of. And, and uh, we don't want to see people hurt. Um, and uh, and you can make a difference in the things that you do. I don't see questions coming in there. So either they all fell asleep, or uh, or we covered the subject. Um, thank you, folks. I appreciate all of uh, all of your work out there. Be safe. If you have questions in, if you have questions or comments or you need help on things, that's what we're here for. That's our job is to, is to help you um, have a better organization, have a better program, and, uh, and we're just a phone call away. Thank you very much. Have a safe day.